So I want you to imagine for a moment that you're a creature. Perhaps you're a single-celled organism, like an amoeba, or something more complex, like a bird or a fish. Now, it's important that you're not human for a moment, because I want you to forget how you're supposed to live. So as this creature, you notice the world changing around you. Maybe there's less food, or that it's got colder. Perhaps there are more extreme weather events. As a creature, you do what you need to, to survive. So you develop a broad range of strategies that allow you to live in other ways. Maybe like this water bear. When the going gets tough, you cover yourself in glass. Perhaps you hibernate, find different food, or move to safer places. But whatever you do, you need to have different options just in case things change again. Now, this process is called adaptation. And it's important that you thought about this as a creature, because when we're human and it comes to dealing with the way we live and work, we've learned that by making buildings, we can bend the world around us, whilst the interior of our homes, and by implication, ourselves, stay the same. Now, since the Industrial Revolution, we've managed to deal with our changing environments by creating these stable interiors. And we use resource-hungry industrial technologies to do this so that we can stay comfortable. Now, in principle, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. But when it comes to a scale of operation where our buildings are responsible for 40% of total global carbon emissions and are poisoning the very environment that sustains us, then something has to change. Now, if we were non-human creatures, we'd be looking for different ways to maintain our presence on this planet and diversify the ways that we construct and inhabit our living spaces. But we're not doing that. We're doing more or less the same things that we've been doing for at least the last 150 years, albeit more considerately and attractively. Now, in this talk, I'm going to be thinking with and through non-human creatures. Specifically, I'll be using the incredible capacity for microbes to deal with change by transforming their environment. And I will consider this ability as a technology, particularly when it's applied to the way that we live and work. In this way, by working along with and through microbes, they can do the changing for us. Now, we mustn't underestimate the power of microbes. And after all, it's these kinds of creatures that trap the sun's energy and turned it into the hydrocarbons that underpin fossil fuels. It is also they that changed the early atmosphere of the Earth from a poisonous reducing environment full of noxious greenhouse gases into one that is rich in oxygen and capable of supporting multicellular life. But I also won't underestimate this power of microbes because over the course of the 20th century, we've increasingly found that some microbes have incredible capacities to take over systems. And these pathogens, like salmonella, have the ability to cause us harm. But most microbes are not pathogens. Less than 1% of the microbes that we know have destructive qualities when it comes to being in proximity with us. In fact, most microbes are life-giving. They are the creatures that make up all the regenerative processes in our soils, and they digest the food in our gut alongside us. Our bodies are teeming with microbes, and each of us has a unique garden of them which is as individual as our DNA. Now, currently, I am coordinator for the Living Architecture Project. 
And this is funded by the EU's Horizon 2020 program to the sum of 3.2 million euro. These are screenshots from our website because the living architecture prototype won't be ready until April 2019. And so I'm afraid I can't show you the final version of it, but I will try and describe what it's going to be like in 2019. So I work with five groups of collaborators from the University of West England in Bristol, the Spanish National Research Council in Madrid, Explorer Biotech in Venice, the University of Trento in Italy, and Liquifer Systems Group in Vienna. Now, our research looks at a near-future scenario where we hand over the processing power of microbes to running a building. So in this way, we're expecting our buildings to have a different impact on resource and environment than those that are powered by fossil fuels. So not only do they produce useful outputs, but they also don't disrupt natural systems. Now, in April 2019, we will build a, um, uh, an interior partition wall. That's the form it will take. And it's made up of these specific building blocks or bricks called bioreactors. And every single one of these is like a bespoke home for a particular group of microbes. So that when we compile these, we can actually think of the living architecture as a programmable city for microbes. But perhaps the best way to describe the living architecture project is not as a structure, but as a digestive system, something like a cow's stomach. Possessing an inner life, it gurgles and feeds on liquid waste produced in our buildings, specifically urine and wastewater. Now, these feedstocks are moved into the different bioreactor chambers, just like in a cow's stomach, where they're processed in different ways. And our system produces electricity, inorganic phosphate, which is the marker of success in the system, polished water, clean water, essentially, oxygen and heat. Now, the end product, uh, waste product, is biomass, which can also be used as compost. Now, Microbes are creatures, so that means when change happens, they respond to it by transforming their environment. And they have extremely adaptable metabolisms. And this means that we can choose different microbial species to process liquid waste in various ways. Complicated diagram, but I'll try and simplify it for you. The big white square is a bioreactor, one of the building blocks of the wall. It's divided into two by a blue dotted line. That's a membrane that allows the selective passage of molecules between the two chambers. In the upper chamber, we have light-loving creatures that take the sun's energy, and in this particular case, they produce a lot of sugar. In the bottom chamber, we have two microbes that don't normally live together. But because there's so much sugar, they stay there and work together to change the metabolism of the space. So essentially, in this project, we also diversify the range of possible processes by using synthetic biology. In other words, there is genetic modification in the um, chamber here. However, if we were to install this outside of a laboratory, we would be looking for microbes that could carry out these same functions without genetic modification. So what does it look like when it's compiled? Well, this again is another diagram. As I said, the bioreactor isn't ready until April 2019. You can see all the little cow stomachs in the middle here. There are nine of them, and they're the bioprocessors. They're being fed by waste that enters into a settlement tank, and they're being boosted by algae that are recycled in the system that are carrying oxygen. So the uh, cow stomachs have a lot of power. Um, and as they process the waste, we collect it, or their products, we collect it in different settlement tanks. We filter off um, clean water, and any genetic uh, materials is neutralized in the yellow uh, box at the bottom. 
So essentially, the system is a symbiosis, not just between microbes sitting within each bioreactor chamber, but also with the humans in the house, which are having their waste processed in exchange for beneficial product, products, particularly electricity and fresh water. And also, um, the, because the, let's say, the genetic uh, modified organisms are neutralized, we're actually just producing biomass at the end. In other words, a proto-soil material. So, Technologically, the key to making this happen is by developing the right kinds of building blocks, the right chambers in which to house these microbes. And we work with two different uh, types. So this is an anaerobic uh, setup. In other words, these are the ones that live in compost, and they can produce electricity, oxygen, and water. On a standalone system like this, this is known as a microbial fuel cell, which is powered by organic waste. The other type of metabolism, it likes light. So this is a photobioreactor, and it's powered by little green algae that takes sunlight and carbon dioxide to produce biomass. Now, the trick is how we bring these two very different worlds together. And we do this in a rather wonky-looking brick here. Um, the, the holes in the middle take ceramic rods that have the composting bacteria in it, and around the outside where the light can get in is the photobioreactor. And the whole system is pinned together through a system of flexible rods, which allows the partition wall to take on a range of different shapes. Now, although the Living Architecture Project does have an overarching vision of designing the metabolisms of our home, and even proposes that this is possible at a city scale, it does not aim to homogenize the way that we live and work. In fact, the Living Architecture Project expects that every single household, like every single body, will have a different microbial population to produce different kinds of products. And in that way, it becomes programmable and flexible. Let's call it a metabolic app that meets environmental needs. Now, living architecture changes the logic that buildings inevitably damage the environment, and therefore the best we can get is a kind of uh, stalemate environmental neutrality. Instead, it embodies a new kind of building performance which selectively integrates non-human agents into these territories, which have been previously designed exclusively to meet human needs and privileges the needs of humans over everything else. But when networked together, living architectures create the possibility of living cities, which may enable significant changes in energy flow, water, and waste, along with associated behavioral changes in consumption and culture. So as our buildings become sites of nutrient recycling and resource processing, we can imagine an overall resource efficiency of human development actually now starting to become transformational and beneficial for urban environments. And particularly with the major waste product being microbial biomass, we could see a side effect of this with being, um, having urban soils resulting in green plants in metropolitan locations, which are climate and environmental remediators. Now, just like being a creature, in adapting to a particular site and lifestyle, there is no one-size-all-fits strategy. And by using this robustness and adaptability of microorganisms, together with other kinds of technologies, not just bricks, uh, perhaps something like this cybernetic system that was designed by architect Philip Beasley for the Venice 2010 Biennale, which is a responsive cybernetic environment that senses the presence of people. And for this, I designed a very simple chemical metabolism that could remove carbon dioxide in the environment. And the point is that our comfortable lifestyles can be maintained by this fusion of, let's say, advanced technology working along with microorganisms, which becomes a membrane through which our changing can happen in response to environmental pressures. So with the right kind of governance, the potential of individual systems and initiatives could strategically be drawn together. 
so that our living cities will benefit ecosystems, remediate ailing atmospheres, and ultimately improve our health. Now, all of this can be done when we acknowledge the presence of the non-humans that cohabit alongside of them and work with them to achieve um, a, an optimum uh, sustainability on this extraordinary planet. Thank you.